How's it going? Is that ready? I think so. Yeah. Seems like the audio is recording. And you know what? This is where you don't need to use the mic. Okay, Joseph, can you hear me? Oh, he doesn't even have his headset on. Yeah. Can you hear me? And Susan and the audience uh, virtually, can y'all hear me okay? All right. Yes. Thank you. I can hear you. It is 6.30, so we're going to start this meeting. Welcome, everyone. Please remember to sign in at the back of the room there. Kathy um, has a sign-in sheet. We want to count for everybody who's here tonight. And, um, yeah, so our speaker tonight is John McKee. He's a longtime member of the South Texas Border Chapter of our Texas Master Nationals. And he's going to talk about this odd couple, this odd couple that he's come across. <laughs> Probably in a, a, a stair or somewhere. So come tell us more about what your program is and entertain us. Uh, the program, Joseph? Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. This is my first foray into major programming now that I'm down here in Texas. Used to do a lot of it up north. Anyway. <laughs> I was telling people up there it was a lot easier because that was the land of the blind and I was the one eye. <laughs> down here, this is not the land of the blind. These are people who know stuff. And, uh, it's going to be a lot more challenging to make sure I'm saying the right things. Yeah. Is that Yeah, there's some table or something. That's too weird. I did. Yeah. Yeah, I have all my notes. It's the sherry. All right. Say it'll be. Okay. Sig and Ann is the old road couple. I'm just going to let that hang there for a couple of minutes. Uh, we will shortly understand how I came up with that. I'm not a very creative person, but this was a, a fit of creativity for me. Um, we're going to talk about dragonflies and damselflies, a very interesting subject to us. Cindy and I have gone through the transition of birding, butterflying, and now dragonflying. She is far more into it than I am. Take sharper vision than mine is anymore, uh, to some degree. So. Let's start off by talking about what a dragonfly is. Um, top of the list there, it's an animal, the kingdom animalia. When I was in, am I using the mic? Am I okay? okay. When I was in uh, school, there were two kingdoms, plant and animal. Now, I don't know, you can read there's five, there's nine. I took an average of seven and uh, Biologists love to complicate things. Anyway, it's an animal. It is in the phylum Arthropoda. There are 31 different phyla. Um, those are jointed leg, chitinous exoskeleton critters. By the way, there's about 150 million uh, animals that have been named scientifically, and they estimate there's probably 10 million out there yet to be discovered. Um, of the hundred or the one and a half million that have been named a million and a quarter are arthropodus so it's a huge phylum it's in the class insecta the insects there's nine different classes in the arthropoda um the insects uh also centipedes spiders crabs all those things are arthropoda the insects uh 
account for about a million of the arthropoda, the million and a quarter arthropoda, and a million and a half of the uh, animals named, about a million of them are insects. So it's just a huge uh, class of critters. And the majority of those are in the beetles, the wasps, butterflies, and moths, et cetera. You get down to the order, the order is odonata, which means skunk for tooth, reef for tooth. They've got tearing, chewing mouth parts in the uh, odonates, um, uh, other things that make them uh, odonates uh, as listed there. There's 30 orders. The odonates are a small order. There's only about 7,500 odonates in the whole world so far uh, identified. And in North America, only 470. We're pretty impoverished in odonates in North America. Uh, in Texas, about 250, and down here in the valley, about 109. Those numbers in parentheses below that are the numbers Cindy has in our life list. I've also seen almost all of them, but there's a couple that she's seen that I haven't. And then you get into two suborders, the Zygoptera and the Anisoptera. So that's Zig and that's Anis, the two suborders of the Odonata, the Ode couple. So that's where my title came from. And in those two suborders, the Zygoptera are the damselflies. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And the Anisoptera are the dragonflies. It's two different suborders. And there's four families in the Zygoptera and seven families in Anisoptera in North America, north of Mexico. The difference between damselflies and dragonflies, there's, there's quite a few biological differences, but the one that we see is the, whoops, there I did it. Oh, shoot, go backwards. Got it. Is the, the uh, I'm not going to use the pointer. The damselflies, when they land, they pull their wings back along their body. Mostly. <laughs> There's always exceptions in the world of biology. The dragonflies always land with their wings spread. Sometimes drooped a little bit, but spread at right angles to their body. That's the difference you can see out in the field when you're looking at them. The, Boy, this thing is sensitive. The uh, anatomy of the two suborders. Start with the damp supplies. Typical insect: head, thorax, abdomen, three body parts. The head is all about eating, seeing, and central control. The thorax is all about locomotion, the wings and the legs. And the abdomen is digestion, reproduction, and respiration. Dragonfly, same basic structure. A couple of details, so they're different and crucial to some of the things I'm going to be talking about as we go along. Both of them have appendages at the end of their body, particularly in the males. The females have them too, and I don't think anybody has figured out why, uh, but the males, those appendages are very critical to their reproduction. And in the damselflies, there's four of them, two paraprox, epiprox. They also have up here under uh, segment two of the abdomen, two and three, a secondary a secondary genitalia. That's called. That's basically a tool kit that they use in mating, and we'll get into that a little bit more too. The dragonflies have three appendages instead of four. They have the two uh, cerci, 
but then one epiproc. So that that is a difference in their structure. Otherwise, they're pretty much identical. You I see the lake spines? Yes. You said epi something. Epiproc. Where's that? That's the one central appendage back there. And on the uh, damp supply, there's two of them called paraprox because there's two. Thank you. And basically, they're, they're, they're grabbers. And uh, what was I? Oh, you see the spines on the legs. You see how spiny their legs are. Some of them are incredibly so. Dragonflies fly around and feed by catching insects, mostly on the wing. They can glean um, things off the leaves or sometimes off the water, but mostly they catch insects on the wing. And they don't grab them with their mouth parts. They grab them with their legs. They, that's what those spines are for, is to make kind of a, a net they catch insects with. So here's some pictures. Showing the secondary genitalia. Boy, I got to be able to see that so yeah. I know what I'm, what I'm looking at. <laughs> um, this is a spread wing. We'll talk about that as well here in after. Anyway, secondary gen secondary genitalia here under the abdomen up there. That's a toolbox. That they use during mating. Oh, thank you, Robert. Yes. Um, they, they perform all kinds of things. They they actually transfer the sperm to the female. They uh, they, they can put a plug in to plug the female so that an, another dragonfly can't get his sperm in. Except some of them have tools that will remove that plug. Uh, so it's quite a toolbox he's got under there. And here's the epiprox of a uh, ray pool spreadway. You can, uh, I hope you can see the two Cersei and the two epiprox, four, four appendages. The four spotted skimmer, not as prominent a secondary genitalia there, but it has it, as they all do in the males. And the sparse sided darner, you see the genitalia with that, the two Cersei, and the one epiprot. So that's the three, and that's the four. And by the way, the spread wings are the exception to the damsel flies folding their wings straight back along their back. They, they spread them at about a 45 degree angle when they're perched. But they're still damsel so flies. So here's what they do with those things. Here's a typical damsel fly. Double striped bluet. This is a common damsel fly all over North America, including here in the valley. They use their appendages to grab a female. You can see he's a scatter. Specifically, in this case, with the damsel flies, they grab on the front of the thorax. And the appendages are shaped different in every species. And the females have matching kind of like keyholes or locks and keys that match the shape of the male's uh, epiprox, paraprox. So it keeps them from mating with the wrong species. So you'll grab a female and sometimes before he does that, he will take his sperm, which he has produced down here, typical, the end of the abdomen, and he will put it up there in the subgenital, so the secondary uh, genitalia. The female has a plate here underneath her terminal or the end of her um, abdomen that fits with that. 
too. So there's another locking inter interaction going on right there where they are locked together and the sperm is being transferred into whatever else is going on. So you can see in the enlargement over there that he's got her behind the head, behind the, uh, in front of the thorax. Whereas on the dragonflies, this eastern ringtails, they grab the female with their three appendages behind the head. They have two of them behind the head and one up between the eyes. So they're actually hanging onto the female's head to do the mating. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same system. And this is called, they're in the wheel position. When this is going on, um, sometimes it takes quite a long time for it to get completed. But once that's all done, and this, this sperm has been uh, put into the female's oviducts, ov ovipositing begins, egg laying. This is a mass egg laying event of, of damselflies over at the uh, Mercedes Waterfalls area. Um, Amelia's thread tails and blue fronted dancers. There's a whole lot of different ways that they oviposit. Uh, these like to use mats of vegetation, put the eggs in those uh, where they're protected from fish eating them and stuff. Um, and when they find a good mat like that, tons of them that will use it at the same time. We've seen episodes like that quite often over there. Here's a picture from, by the way, these are all Cindy's photographs. There's a picture there of a amber wing spread wing, which are not present here in the valley. I don't think they're present here in Texas. No. no. Okay. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I left the range map in there. Uh, they actually have a cutter, the female does, here on over positor, where she'll cut a slit in a stem like that and insert the egg into the stem of the plant above water usually so that when the egg hatches the nymph can drop down into the water the plant keeps it moist enough so it doesn't dry out and it's fully protected from any predator that wants to eat it or uh, a wasp or a fly that wants to uh, parasitize it so a, a lot of the fact i think all the spread wings kind of uh do that I left that range map in there. This slide came from a program I did when Cindy and I were doing surveys on the dragonflies and damselflies in a four county area in Illinois uh, with a survey we were doing for the State Museum. And one of the problems that dragonfly distribution has had is it's been very poorly studied. The citizen scientists haven't gotten into it that much. You notice that range map out of uh, Dennis Paulson's book, which is the Bible, shows Illinois and Indiana pretty much doesn't have this dragonfly. It's all around us. It's it's more of a wet, uh, wooded wetlands kind of, um, whereas Illinois in particular was considered pretty much prairie. So I guess they kind of assumed it wouldn't be there. Well, Cindy and I found them and got specimens to document it in the State Museum's uh, collection in three of the four counties we were studying. So that's what citizen science can do to adding to the scientific knowledge. And here's a common green darner, probably dragonfly you've all seen, uh, very, very common, big guy. Um, that male is hanging on to the female while she sticks the eggs on the underside of that lily pad so that they're not floating around in the water easily. So these are just a couple of examples of, of the things they do. They'll lay them in wet logs, they'll throw them up in the shore, they'll lay them in leaf litter. Uh, they just do all kinds of uh, different behaviors. Then the eggs hatch. 
and you go into the second phase of a dragonfly slider, and that's the nymphs, or some people prefer to call them the naiads. Nymphs that live in the water are usually referred to as naiads or frequently so. That's a typical dance of fly nymph. These are gills right here that it uses to respire in the water. All the damsel flies have external gills like that. That's a dragonfly nymph, and that's not. Um, I want to send these pictures. I had to get that online. We don't have a picture of a dragonfly nymph. No gills, usually bulkier. Uh, actually, they can absorb oxygen from the water kind of through their bodies. But they do a lot of their uh, respiration by bringing water in through their anus and absorbing the oxygen out of it, then expelling it. That's that's how they breathe, so to speak. Wow. And there are there are videos. I really needed to know that. <laughs> there are videos on Facebook. Oh my the <laughs> then after the nymphs are fully grown. And they might molt anywhere from eight to 18 times in their growth. Some of them take a month to do that. Some of them take many years, particularly up north where the water is uh, extremely cold most of the time. They have a very short growing season, and it can take them many years to mature to this point. <clears throat> when they are, when the nymphs are fully mature, they'll crawl out of the water. Uh, in this case, onto a rock in a park right by where we used to live. Most of the time, up a stem or something like that along the shoreline, and they will exuviate. They will split their last um, shell and crawl out just like uh, cicadas do. We're just finished having dinner at a restaurant. We're taking a little walk in the park to work it off and down by the Illinois River. Saw this guy just beginning to exuviate. By the time Cindy got back to her car and got her back to the car and got the camera and back down to the river, it had come out as far as its uh, head and thorax, split the top of the shell, and pushed himself out that far. Oh, wow. Then he pushed himself out further. Then he couldn't push himself out anymore, and uh, he bent over and pulled his abdomen out the rest of the way. You see the wings are still uh, still all curled up there, and the legs have come out. There he's fully out of the uh, exuvia, but the abdomen is still very accordioned up, and the wings are still not very well uh, formed. There, he's pretty well bumped himself up. He's bumped uh, all the air into his wings and uh, the fluid into the veins, expanding the uh, abdomen more. And at that point, he flew off and we lost him. He flew up into the grass. If we had found him, probably the next morning, this was late in the evening. Uh, most of this goes on at night for most species uh, because. They're very vulnerable to be eaten by birds right now. Very soft, very delicious. If we found that guy the next morning, that's what it would have looked like. A russet tip, club tail. Uh, and you notice the shine on the wings of that one? That means he is still what is called tenoral. It's not fully formed yet. It's still drying out from the exuviating. And uh, that might be what he... What it looked like the next morning, still trying to dry his wings off that day. Wrong button. What was that time span? About 12 hours? I got it. Good picture? Yeah, from the Subia. Oh. oh that's like you know, that's that's a question. I I don't have access to these pictures right now. They're Cindy's working on trying to get her computer organized where I could go back and find them. They're pretty old pictures. But um, it, once I get to the raw pictures, I can look at the timing. But what I can look at here is 
See where that shadow is there at the end of them? It's about halfway up the abdomen. So that's how much the shadow has moved at sundown. So it hasn't been a long time. Mm -hmm. oh. They don't always work out perfectly. This is a very interesting thing we saw out on, again on the Illinois River on the back bay. Cindy actually had to wait out the buck a ways to get a halfway decent picture. That's a mayfly. They have the same incomplete uh, metamorphosis of the damsel flies as the damsel flies. A dyad in the water to come out and uh, exuviate. That would crawl up on a rock to dry out. And a damsel fly nymph crawled up, got its legs wrapped around its wings, which then its wings were locked shut. He couldn't, couldn't open his wings. And then he exuviated. And, uh, crawled up to the top to go through his drying out <laughs> again, holding the wings together. So that poor mayfly that was only going to live a day anyway, uh, never had a chance to. His genes were taken out of the pool. And you will find if you're looking in wetland areas, walk in the boardwalk in Australia on a Exuvia on the reeds. These are a couple of typical um, club tail of exuvia, just to show you some examples. And again, they don't always work out. This is something we found laying on the ground in one of our walks. What I assume happened here is this skimmer dragonfly crawled up on a reed and exuviated just fine. Another one came up the same reed later and grabbed onto that one to do its exuviating. Well, as the adult was working his way out, the gyrations shook this guy loose from the perch, the reed that it was hanging on to. And they fell to the ground, and that caused the wings to get messed up on the dragonfly, and it never finished exuviating. Its, it's abdomen is still down in the uh, exuvia there. Okay. Back to the suborders and the families. The damselflies, four families, we're going to ignore that plastic. plastic Plasticity. I've got a practice. Plasticity. There's only been one of those, one individual found in Arizona. But to make the whole US list, of North American list, add up, that one has to be included. So we're going to ignore it. Uh, Coopterogeny, Lestony, and Synagrianity. Broad winged damsels and spread winged damsels and the bond damsels are the three families that we have to deal with here in North America in general. About 140 damsel flies in North America. The Colopterichidae. There's only about nine in North America, six in Texas, and Two in the valley. And the numbers in parentheses again are the, the number that Cindy has on our life list just for general edification. And these are the two that are found in the valley the American ruby spot and the smoky ruby spot. This family is pretty much a river family, uh, nice, fast flowing, usually, or fairly fast flowing streams and rivers with pretty clear water, something we don't have much of in the valley. So we don't see a whole lot of these. The American ruby spot and the smoky ruby spot we do have down here. Americans are pretty scarce. We see more smokies than Americans. Um, they're pretty similar, although the smokies, the whole wing could be dark uh, sometimes. And the, the difference that you can see in the field with a good pair of binoculars is 
the white appendages on the American and the dark appendages on the, on the smoky. Back to the rain pool dancer uh, for the spread wings. The most common uh, rain, rain pool spread wing, did I say dancer? Spread wing, excuse me. There's about 19 spread wings in North America, 11 in Texas, six in the Valley. Um, there's one city you haven't seen yet, and uh, she gets mad if we talk about it. <laughs> it's a rare one that a number of people have found in Santa Ana, and we've never been able to, and it frustrates her. The chalky spread wing is the second most common one here in the Valley. And it's called chalky because very quickly after they have matured, like these obviously are, they develop pruinosity as do many of the dragonflies and damselflies. It's a waxy white or gray or blue coating that they exude that covers their body. And when these guys get pruinose, they're they're really chalky looking. They're all they're just all, all white, and uh, there, there doesn't seem to be a real good uh, explanation of why they're doing that. Uh, they have found that that coating reflects ultraviolet light, so they think it might be a help with uh, protecting them from overheating and bright sun and stuff. <laughs> The St. Agriotidae, the pond damsels, these are the most common family. You know, it's 110 species. And these guys are not fussy much about where they live, ponds, swamps, fens, marshes, rivers, slates, any place. There's, you can find it, some pond damsels. The familiar bluehead is the most common one probably in the whole country. Uh, they're just about everywhere. The neotropical bluet is less common by a lot. Um, it's still a bluet, even though it's got a pretty dark abdomen, whereas the familiar has a blue abdomen. There's kind of two classes of bluets, the dark ones and the blue, blue ones. Key field mark on these in the field is that black line between the blue on the tail. Most of them have blue tails, and you can see that that one's broken nicely. There's a bunch of dancers in the Sinagriotidae. The blue ring dancer, again, a very, very common dance will fly. Um, we see tons of them every time we go out. The golden wing dan dancer, on the other hand, the quote mark I've got up there, the double hash, that means it's a valley specialty. If it's only a single mark, it means it's kind of a Texas specialty. But this is a valley specialty. And we looked for those for a long time. And when we first got down here, we were looking for golden wing dancers. We kept seeing these guys and thinking, oh, look at those golden wings. Up north, the blue ring dancer does not have tinted wings. Down here they do. We have finally found the best place for finding golden wing dancers is over at uh, McAllen Nature Center. And if you notice the difference in the, uh, the markings on the abdomen or on the thorax a little bit, but mostly, well, two different shades of blue. You can see that in the field quite easily. The blue ring dancer have a pale tail and a very dark thorax. These guys are both the same shade, but you look right there at uh, segment three of the abdomen. It's pretty much solid black. Here it's more of a stripe on the sides. And you might need pictures to identify that, but that's that's how we know that this is a golden wing. Rambler's fork tails, friend of mine, a uh, friend of ours, calls these fork tails flying hairs. They're tiny little things. Uh, fortunately, they got a nice bright green thorax and a nice bright blue tail, and you can see those two things moving around in the reeds. Uh, you can't see what they're, that they're connected, but they follow each other all the time. Uh, very common down here. Uh, there's a number of fork tails. Uh, we don't have those up north. 
the desert fire tail, all red, another little bitty guy. Um, and these are a couple of our favorites. The Caribbean yellow face, that's a valley specialty. And that's just a cool looking bug. Uh, we find them in quite a few places. And then the claw tip bluette, it's exactly the opposite. That's probably one of the rarest ordinates that Cindy's ever found. Um, you can see the, the big appendages there for a, for a, a bluette. That, why it's called claw tip. We found that at um, the San Juan wetlands, and uh, that created a bit of a stir. People were rushing over there to get a look at it. I think it's only been reported about 13 times in Texas, and when Sydney found it, it was much less than that. <clears throat> okay, the Anisoptera, the dragonflies, seven families, the Pendulurini. The uh, got to go back and look at that. The petal tails, of course. The Eschmini, the Darners, the Company, the Club Tails, the Grimagraspini, the Spike Tails, the Necromedi. I'm, I'm refreshing my mind here because it's blocked out up there. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's only two petal tails in all of North America. This one, the great petal tail, is pretty widespread. It's a very interesting dragonfly. Uh, and it is here, well, it's not here in the valley. Uh, you got to go north of Texas a little ways. Uh, this picture was taken at uh, White and Springs up in the uh, Angelina forest area. They're big, like that, and they have a penchant for landing on people. They, they I don't know, they're, they, you're wearing a light shirt, which we usually do in the field for heat. And, uh, They'll, they'll land on it all the time. I, I'll never forget we were at a Dragonfly Society field trip one time, and a little guy from, I shouldn't say a little guy, but he is a little guy from the Washington, D.C. area. Bent over to pick something up or to take a picture of something on the ground, and one landed on his back. And there were a whole bunch of people around, and of course, everybody had their cameras. Nobody would let him move. Until they got their picture. This poor guy just half crawled. Can I stand up and I can I stand up? <laughs> I really felt sorry for him. But they're kind of plain, but they're big. And this one up in those pine areas, the Angelina National Forest, look at how well camouflaged he is. He even came in and landed on that tree right next to us. And we had the darnest time finding him. And all I had to do was look away and look back, and I'd lost him. I had to kind of get a sideways look and see him uh, sticking out of the trunk rather than right against it. None of them in the valley. The other one, by the way, is in the Pacific Northwest, and we've never got out there to look for that one. The darners, the extra Everybody loves the darners. Common green darner, of course, is the, the one we all know, very common throughout uh, the eastern part of the country, at least. Got the CBS eye on its top of his face there. Um, the blue spotted comet garner, on the other hand, a valley specialty, is not common at all. There are what five to eight garners that come up from Mexico into the valley periodically. Sometimes there's kind of eruptions of them, but mostly they're they're really hard to find, and they are targeted by all the the chasers when the right season comes. And it's coming in now. Uh, people are down here. Santa Ana used to be good, but now it's so dry. The sterile uh, on the Green Jay Trail can be good for them. The blue spot of comet that was in Santa Ana, wasn't it? Yeah, you saw two of them in Santa Ana. Those are big, three to four inch long. I hate this nomenclature. You got a blue spot of comet garner and you got a comet garner. That's that shouldn't be done. 
it's going to be, you know, which common diner did you see? Well, the one that isn't blue spotted. <laughs> um, that picture was taken up in Illinois. We have seen these guys in the valley. They're rare, or at least very uncommon, but they're widespread. When we were doing survey work and, and collecting a few specimens, sometimes Cindy would take them a live one, put it in the refrigerator, and cool it down to where it wasn't moving, and then scan it in her computer and get these beautiful scans showing all the detail. So that's that's a scan kind of darn. We have seen that down here. Another one, the Caribbean darner. These guys are just beautiful. I just very, very striking. The club tails. Got the D. Sulfur tip club tail is probably, oh, by the way, 104 in the country. Or, uh, they're in North America, 32 in Texas, and nine here in the valley. And we've seen all nine of them. Uh, the sulfur tip is the most common down here in the valley, and its range goes all the way up kind of straight north in a swath up through the panhandle and up to Kansas, and also spreads out over west along the border. Um, but we will see them every year. NBC is a good place to find them. Uh, the canal uh, at Benson. The Tamalipan club tail, on the other hand, is a valley specialty that's not easy to find at all. In fact, we haven't seen one in two years, maybe. They're very difficult to tell apart in the field. Don't let the green and yellow fool you. That can vary. It can also be affected by lighting and so on. The uh, field part that Cindy likes to use most is the lights. See the yellow in the thighs of the sulfur tip, all black in the time of leaving. That's the way we tell them apart. Flag tail spiny legs, fairly common down here and a very widespread dragonfly. The, the club tails are a dragonflyer's favorite dragonflies. They're big, they're spectacular, they're colorful, and they sit for pictures. Uh, they pose very, very nicely. They're not real jumpy. Uh, even if you do flush one, you watch. And it'll settle down somewhere else. You approach it, flush it again. It'll do that a couple of times, and then it'll let particularly her walk right up to it. Oh. Or, or you just wait, and it'll come back to the same perch you flushed it off of. So they're very cooperative. Pull so the legs there. Oh, okay. Yeah, leg tail, spiny leg. Look at those spines on the legs. There's another one, the black shouldered spiny leg. That uh, doesn't get here to the valley, but you don't have to go very far north to find them. They've got real long, they got longer legs than most of them. Those thighs are longer, and they got some big, heavy spikes on them. A couple more of uh, the ones regularly seen here in the valley, but fairly widespread uh, throughout the south are the dorsal tails. Their appendages, you can kind of see it on this one. They are, they are really hooks. If you look at them straight down from the top, they make a like a big circle. And uh, I'm sure when they get a hold of a female, she doesn't get away. Uh, broad stripe and narrow stripe, they're both here in the valley. And uh, we'll see them just about every year. In fact, we do see them every year. Now. Right now, it's flight time for them. Okay, the Cordula uh, Gastrity. Yeah. Those are the uh, spike tails. Spike tails, yeah, spike tails. Thanks, Cindy. There's only 10 of them in the North America, um, three of them in Texas. None of them get to the valley. 
This one is the only one that we've seen in Texas. The arrowhead spike tail. This picture was taken up north, uh, again around that Boykin Springs area. And we only got side pictures of it. So I put in this picture from Illinois showing the back. And you can see why it's called the arrowhead spike tail. You look at those marks down the back of the abdomen. And the cruisers are the necromedity. Yes. Yeah, that's what it looks like to say it. Um, these are, again, big dragonflies. Most of these guys that don't make it to the valley, again, are river species. And while we have the Rio Grande, it's silted, sluggish. Uh, it isn't very conducive to the dragonflies. And there are very few places where you can get to it or even get close to the, the shoreline woods and stuff that these guys like to fly in. But this is the one that is in the valley, the Bronze River Cruiser. And that was uh, taken at uh, the Butterfly Center. The Cardulianine. Yeah. Yeah, the Cordulianine. These are the basket tails and the animals. Big family, 50 species, North America. Um, 15 in Texas, only one in the valley. And if you look at Cindy's numbers on these, it's pretty bad. Um, only five of the 15 in Texas. And we added two a couple of weeks ago. We went north to try and beef that up. They're horrible to try and uh, get. Uh, they hardly ever land when you do find them. They tend to hunt. Uh, early morning and evening, and they zip around like mad. They don't land to identify them. You gotta get a net on them. So you can't, you can't do it any place where nets are bad, all the state properties and so on. Um, this one, Cindy happened to catch up by Victoria early in the morning when it was still too cold, chilly weather. And so it was still perched for the night. It was wagging its tail around, which is kind of unusual behavior for dragonfly. Uh, I presume probably trying to warm itself up a little bit to uh, do his morning hunt. And this is the Prince Basket tail, and this is the one that's in the valley. And here's another scan of what that looks like if you get a real nice one um, spread out, showing all the detail. And then lastly, the uh, Livalulidae, the pot hawks. And this is, again, a big family, 113 of them in North America, 87 of them in Texas. These are the pond dances. These are the guys that live in um, any kind of pot, uh, as long as it stays wet long enough to complete its life cycle. Um, the back 70 at uh, NBC has a, a Pond they have manufactured that they are right now it's dry, but they usually keep some water in it and it has lots of skimmers in it. The Blue Dasher and the Eastern Pond Hawk are the two most common throughout Eastern North America, at least. Uh, the Eastern Pond Hawk, by the way, these are about an uh, inch and a half, two inches long at the most. Now, the eastern pond hawk, when it emerges, it looks like that guy over there, that green one on the left. The females stay that way. The males get brunos and look like this. One of the reasons that I think a sun protection is a good idea on a fluidacity. Another little feature. Um, female dragonflies and damselflies, when they emerge, they will leave 
the water to a large degree. They will move inland. We find some little damp supplies in our yard and Donna. They're, they're a long ways from anything. They're almost always females. They have a fairly long time before they're ready to mate. And they want to get the heck away from all those crazy males that are down by the water fighting over territory and fighting to attract females. So they they spend more time out in the sun lying around out in the open trying to establish territories and so on. So there might be an explanation of why the pruinosity certainly almost entirely occurs in the males. Great pond dog looks a lot like that eastern pond dog. Uh, you're walking the trails at Frontera, at Estero, and anywhere, and there's a dragonfly flying around you. I think trying to pick the bugs off that you're picking up or attracting um, is most likely going to be one of these guys. The roseate skimmer and the carmine skimmer, these are big skimmers. And uh, the roseate is very common. We see them just about every time we go out. The carmine is less common. And you can see the difference, the purple thorax on the roseate, uh, nice and still light, bright red and the red face on the carmine. Red tail pennants and spot tail dashers. <clears throat> um, the spot tail dashers kind of a valley specialty. There are some uh, over uh, far west Texas or somewhere. There's a small population, but mostly they're a valley specialty. Pretty small, quite common. Red tail pennants, quite common. Uh, they're starting to fly now. Bandwing dragon lettuce. Very common. You see them kind of in, in wooded uh, areas around water. Pin tailed pond hawks. Uh, you see that thin tail. That guy's got himself a meal of a bee fly, it looks like. By the way, all these pictures I've showed you have been males. Males are the pretty ones. Of course. Couple of our favorites, the Mexican scarlet tail. This is just a striking, beautiful dragonfly. And we'll see a few every year. They're not common. Benson, down at the boat launch in Benson is a good place to see them. We've had them at a sterile. We've had them at NBC. They're just, they're just gorgeous. The three stripe dasher is the rarest of the dashers. Valley specialty. Uh, three stripes refer to the three black stripes on its thorax, and the uh, Green Jay Trail in the sterile is probably the place Cindy sees the most. Saddlebags, quite a few saddlebags uh, in North America. Um, you see the, the color in the hind wing, that's why they're called saddlebags. Uh, Big saddles, red saddle bags, very common throughout eastern North America. Uh, they're migrants. When it gets cold up north, they'll start coming south. They will not return. They'll have young down here, and then those will go back north in the summer, summertime. The striped saddle bags has real narrow uh, saddles and a stripe on its thorax usually, and they're, uh, we see them down here. Never seen them anywhere else. They're not special specialists here. They're, they're, they must be further west. I think they are a more western species. And finally, the Vermilion Saddlebags. This is another one of the rarest critters that we've seen down here. We saw that at uh, the San Juan Wetlands. And see, it's got a very narrow saddle. It's got very little black on its tail, long appendages. All the key field marks showed up in this picture that we needed to confirm that it was a vermilion saddlebag. And there have only been maybe 
15 or so of these reported that ordered out of Central in the last 20, that's 13 years in Texas. Uh, most of them are seen in South Florida. So this is a rarity, and this picture is, if you look up the, uh, the website, the local website, which one is it? Cindy? The Facebook page. Oh, the Facebook page. Okay. Texas Dragons and Dancers. Yeah. The banner, that Facebook page has that picture on it. So here's a few resources if you're interested in learning more. I have all three of those books over here for you to look at if you choose. Uh, one other thing I would mention. Um, If you're into dragonflies or butterflies, and not bad for birds, I really recommend these binoculars. These are the best close focus binoculars you could ever buy. And they're 130 to 150 bucks on Amazon, which is the only place you can find them. But they'll focus like that. They're having a, like having a microscope in your hand. And for close up work on small things, I just love them. Besides which, no, no wait till. What color yeah. are they again? These are um, Swift. No, no. Ben. Pentax. 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 P a p i l l o n. The French French for butterfly. Papillon. And my Amazon. I have tried like mad to find a wholesale source where. All the gift shops around here could stock these, and they apparently do not only sell them online uh, directly because I just cannot find any way to do it. So, but they're 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 great. Okay, if anybody's still awake and has questions, I'll be glad to uh, answer what I can. Yes, Ann. Eight, 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 eight. They're blackers, are they eights? They're eights. They, they have a, uh, a eight by eight. thing is gone. So, uh, is it eight and a half by 21? Yeah, they, they only make right, two. two. I think they got a six and an eight. I think they are in the magnification. And I would highly recommend the eights. Yeah, it's eight, eight point five by twenty one or six point five by twenty one. And they're eight point five seven dollars right in. Oh, they on sale. Okay, that's brown. Yeah, right they now, yes. <laughs> they're, they're on sale last week. Yeah, I they're good for moths too. Yeah, they used to make a hundred forty dollars. <laughs> yeah, good for moths, right? Right. <laughs> Anything you can get close to lights. Yeah. Again, you said, uh, the lifespan of the uh, dragonflies is about three months. Well, that's why it's a difficult question to answer. Nothing, nothing dies of old age in nature. <laughs> um, so they figure a bus to, uh, well, the migrants. Probably the garners, the green garners. The garners and some of the big ones can. can Last for eight months, maybe six, eight months. Right. Six weeks. There are so many variables, uh, like how, how long does it take for the nymph to develop? Uh, water temperatures make a big difference. Uh, the weather, if the water warms up early and it stays warm, they'll develop faster. If the water warms up and they start developing, and then you get a bad cold spell and the water gets real cold again, they'll stop. So they can they can you know vary their time, but you know probably a month would be a kind of a typical life, lifespan for the average skimmer type dragonfly. If a so person marks so out or you know. so what I was getting at is they when they migrate down here and they lay their eggs, like you say, uh, their life expectancy they would live their whole life here um, and not go back. No. But I do not know honestly whether when the green darners or the uh, red basket tails migrate down here, 
Yeah. Three. Whether that generation lives its whole lifespan down here or not, I doubt it. I would suspect that they're the ones that go back in the spring. By the time they complete the nymph stage and go to the adult stage, they may they may be like like the monarchs that they have a complete lifespan here, and then their offspring go further north and so on. I don't know that answer. Okay, so it looks like most, or not all, of your photographs are in the natural setting. Do they come to bait of any type, like butterflies will? No, but during the moth night. Yeah, they, they sometimes you'll get, you'll, get a, you'll get a couple that come in the nighttime and try to eat the moths. Yeah, they, they're attracted to the lights. If <laughs> if somebody bumps a, a tree or something, they're, they're on. They'll wake up and see the light and come to the sheet too. They're very confused by it. Their yeah. their big eyes are not good for that bright light yeah. at night. John, okay. John, do you have any idea how far south they migrate? Do they go down to Central America or? Any idea how far you're going? Well, let me one one thing about I can tell you the wandering glider, which is all the way around the world, the ones that have from South Africa go across the ocean and land on the island, they lay their eggs within four weeks, they fly. And then the next generation goes to India. So they can and they have really big wide wings, so they can really go long distance. So who knows? Find some of them do go south. The, this, this migration, let, let me add to that. I'll get you. The migration of the dragonflies is what I call a situational migration for some reason or another. It's like robins. They only move when they're forced to. And they only move as far as they have to. So I would suspect that they don't move much beyond here it gets drier there's there's less rivers and so on it gets more desert maybe as you go further south into mexico um i don't know i'm speculating that but there's no need for them to they come here they find the rio grande they find ponds and stuff here that's that's all they're looking for and it never gets too cold for them here and they're not breeding here. Like the blue spotted is probably not breeding here. And neither is Caribbean, but they do show up here. And I think a lot of it is weather becoming like John Ferris. Okay, I said not John. Oh, yes, yeah, very good. <laughs> What's the variation in size? Things? Um, and that's the one thing I didn't tell with the mm -hmm. with the with the photographs, the various sizes, and like you said, the, the ones that migrate from Africa have a longer wind wingspan. I mean, what's the small? Which one's the smallest, and what's the? Oh, well, that's one that's called an elfin skimmer. That is that big. It's a dragonfly. I mean, they got the great paddle tail, which is about that big. Yeah, so there's a lot of variation. I would say max. In North America, three to four inches of body length. Minimum three quarters of an inch. You go out to the coast, you'll see some smaller ones out to the coast. They they actually are in that brackish water. Yeah, by the way, there are no saltwater dragonflies or, or damselflies. They don't they don't live in salt water. There's a few that can survive in brackish uh Adolf, what's the park? Adolf something park. Oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah, that's a good place to go. That place swarming with dragonflies. Not a lot of variety, but lots of uh, individuals of ones that can use brackish water. Get, get on, huh? Well, I was going to say, I remember from last year, a couple of years ago, isn't there a, 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 a another odonata simple? Uh -huh. Yeah. That, but did, wasn't there a week, oh, not a week or uh, something, too? Yeah. Yeah. What week is that? Oh, Olympics. They have not posted one. Okay. That's that what last one was in January. But they have not posted them. Watch that all. I used to be the treasurer for the Dragonfly Society of the Americas. 
for a few years. I have one more slide. Um, those are those are spiders. Those are those nasty spiders. <laughs> yeah, praying mantises. Yeah, praying mantises. Yeah. No, dragon dragonflies really love the dragonflies. Yeah. We've got pictures of them doing. Especially it. those little bitty common uh, eastern pond hogs. Those guys are they'll eat anything. <laughs> yes. Oh, I wanted to ask about the scanning. What do you use to like keep the light out and keep from smashing the insect? I stood a mouse head. Uh huh. Turn it out, put two of them together, put it on the screen. And then I got made a felt, little felt paper so that their legs would stick to it and just. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. But those were, those were, uh, those were dragonflies that were going to the state museum as specimens. Uh -huh. I'm not sure if you scan them, whether you, if you turn them loose when their eyes are damaged or not, like Joan said, light, the real light can be. So they, you know, that could actually be damaged. But the ones I had, I killed them. <laughs> the, the scientists will not accept sites. A, like, you know, we say, okay, we've got this species in this county and it's the first time. They won't accept that without a specimen. So what we were doing in the four counties was collecting a male and a female of each specimen of each species we could find. That's all we were doing, just one male, one female. And we contributed about 300 and close to 350 uh, documentation specimens to the State Museum. And one was the first time in Illinois. Yeah, one of them the first time in Illinois, right? Um, well, yeah, it was fun. I like doing that. I like citizen science. Well, we were actually collecting seeds in a wetland. <laughs> By the way, on the Old Olympics. Um, I was actually in the top. Yeah. I was. Imagine, I was, you, I was you could spot them. I just see them flitting around. I, I mean, in the, whole, in the whole U.S. and South America, I was number one. Well, we really worked at it. And they did one in the summertime for North America, but South Americans could participate too, but it wasn't prime time for them down there. And vice versa, they did one in January for the South America, but we could participate in that one. So we participated, participated in yeah, both. Okay. And we would get 40, 45 species here in the Valley, even in January. And we would do it in, we'd visit like 15 sites, maybe make multiple visits. And uh, all the data with pictures, documenting pictures were submitted to Odenada Central. And we enjoyed it. I, I, I really do enjoy doing that kind of surveying and citizen science work. But they had one last January and we haven't heard another word. So, and it's this time of the year that they usually the summer one. So like all volunteer things, they have a lifespan and they fade away. Well, the, the Central, did it have some, have some uh, educational videos or something there? Yeah, it did while well, the COVID was. They okay. Have, okay. That's probably when I would dive into it a little bit more. So. Yeah, now they're back to doing their annual meeting, like they just had one in Oklahoma. It's been fascinating. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you all for your attention. I appreciate it. My problem is getting them to be still enough that I can get a picture. Okay, club okay. tails. Yeah. Yes. Bugbills and damsel Well, and if I wanted to collect them, I can't do it at the state parks, that's but right. I can do it in golf and actually, courses. That's, that's yeah. one of the reasons why we did the golf courses study, can be good because we were able to get permits for everything. I think that's where I've seen a lot of this golf courses. <laughs> okay. And if you're going to get, by the way, if you're going to get your first book, get one of John Abbott's books. Yes. Uh, these are Texas only, so you don't have to. Please. Study the whole country or even the whole eastern half or western half of the country. So it's a good place to start. Okay, thanks again. Thank you.
And I know he started right at 6.30 and it's almost a, it's a, about a quarter till. Yeah, I totally Everybody yeah. can have uh, that little bit extra AT credit. Run out. Yeah, 1.25 for AT credit for that excellent program. I had fun looking at that. All right. Um, we'll go ahead. I think the business meeting will be brief. Uh, you're welcome. If you need to take a break, don't, don't wait on us. I mean, um, go ahead and uh, I don't mind being interrupted for you to do that. Um, treasurer's report. Uh, those were sent out with our uh, agenda. And uh, I treasure Gail is here tonight. If anybody has questions for her. And if there are no questions on the treasury report, we will file those for audit. And she, what she does is both a budget and financial report and then a monthly, um, showing the monthly income and expenses. So that's why there's two reports there. And thank you very much, Gail. Um, we didn't get uh, June meeting minutes last, I don't know if those of you were here. Uh, recognize it or not, but we were having a little bit of difficulties with, we lost the internet and stuff. And so um, our secretary was out in California, plus the time difference, it was really difficult for her. So we're gonna put our heads together and come up with a set of minutes for y'all. Um, I've been gone and she's been busy, so we didn't get to it at the top of this meeting. So watch for those June minutes to come out. Um, Jennifer's been doing a good job on programs. I, don't, I think she's still looking for August. Yeah, this is July. August, yes. September is snake September. So snake September for snakes. All right. I'm going to bring my friend who hates snake. I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> he remembers her. She had a bit. What's his name? Uh, Clint. Uh, I forget what his last name is. Okay. He works at the zoo. Uh, oh, okay. And I don't see Ronnie here this evening. I don't remember if he said anything. Yeah. I don't have my phone yeah. with me. Do we want to just submit the report? And uh, I can put it on the screen. And... Okay, good. Ronnie's also been putting in a lot of hours working. Just can't believe these people at work. Okay. Right. There's our monthly report of active members and in training. Some are still from the classes. We had 20 members logged in for service in 18 hours. And I need to go back and do some mine. That's probably why it's in the file. I thought we could possibly have that. <laughs> So uh, be sure to post your hours and keep up with that because you can see the impact it makes. Even though uh, we haven't had a big turnout this summer, it's been hot, a lot of people are traveling right now, uh, but that we still did uh, over $7,000 of the impact uh, in our community. And like I say, if you look at year to date, and we're not we're barely through half the year because this is just the June statistic. Well, that's true. So, We'll hit a hundred thousand by the six month period. I think that's great. That's great. And then um, home service at direct outreach. So if you're going to any events where you have people coming in and visiting with you, be sure and kind of keep up with the number of adults and the number of youths. Like if you're um, doing classes that come through at Estero, if you can keep up and let them, they'll tell you how many children to expect. 150 or whatever, <laughs> and uh, just keep track of the fact that you saw X number of children. Um, or if you're going to be at the Fairy Fest uh, in Edinburgh, oh, there'll be lots of adults and youth up there. If you can keep track of any of them, somebody you can get those little clickers like you do when you're counting rows for knitting or some little thing to put in your your hand to help count. Or for um, a, an event like. Uh... Like the moth night we're going to have at quinta they're, they're selling tickets so they'll know exactly how many people are showing up exactly yeah so ask them, them after things. you're done oh so remember to ask for those that information do they charge for children there i don't know i think maybe for certain ages i'd have to look back river i know we have people who yes. earn awards 
We have two uh, recertifications, and uh, I don't think either one is here, but it's Michael Doyle and Catherine Brush uh, for recertification. All right. And I know Anita isn't here this evening, but um, uh, she's been doing her blogs and the newsletter, newspaper articles. So keep up with those. They're always very interesting and fascinating. Um, and she will put links to them on our uh, South Texas Border Chapter site. So you can keep up with them that way. Hey, Joseph, you have anything as webmaster? If you're going crazy at these meetings, right. then I'm not that asking. Yeah, well, I guess the one thing I could tell you guys from last uh, month, uh, when our first virtual meeting, the reason we have for you guys online, uh, you're seeing three three different views of us right now. Uh, we borrowed an owl uh, meeting uh, meeting owl, I guess that's what it's called, from the state. Uh, they uh, they got these for the, the virtual meetings, the a annual virtual meetings, and uh, they loaned them out to chapters. And uh, so when they were down here uh, and they had one with them, I said, "Can we borrow that?" So uh, it took us a while to get around to using it. But it looks uh, it's pretty nice. So if if you know how much those cost, we didn't spend that money. We're borrowing it. All right, uh, Nick, Becky, you wanted to say something about your advanced training? I think you and your sidekick have done a great job keeping the listings going. Of what opportunities are there? Well, I want to first of all thank Judy Perkins for that incredible list of AT credits that she had uh, submitted and posted for the whole month of July. Um, now, I really have to thank her um, big time for that. Um, with regard to AT and field trips, I just want to say that everybody, I think, has seen the list of the moth nights coming up. And Joseph, I hope that's correct. I yeah. Hope my look, the dates and the times are correct, I hope. Yep, I think the, so. Uh, on the email I sent, um, the big news is that in August, we are scheduled to go to the Brownsville weather station in person. Um, Barry Goldsmith is going to give us a presentation and we will watch a weather balloon go up with an explanation of how the weather balloon operates. Now, the one caveat is that it is limited in terms of attendees. I will send out instructions uh, for people to email me uh, whether they will be attending because pre-registration is required so that we know how many people will be able to attend or will attend. So once again, uh, I'll send that, in, that information out. In September, we have a beach social and Anita has lined up a wonderful program of at the, at the island that will be uh, on yeah. um, shells and sea beans and it sounds like it's going to be an excellent program um, the uh, shell uh, south Padre island shell club doing a presentation it will also include going out um, to the beach the location will be determined uh, a little bit later uh, so those are the three uh, field trips coming up if weather causes the um, August field trip to the um, weather station to be canceled, because um, Barry said that if all hands are required on deck with regard to weather related uh, activities, <laughs> that, that will have to be canceled and rescheduled. And if it is canceled, I will come up with another field trip. Uh, perhaps to take its place around that time. I'll put it that way. And that's it. That's great. Getting out and about. Um, the one volunteer uh, project, Susan's online. She's up in Denver, I think, still. Um, the one that uh, is coming up is going to be the same evening of our um, moth field trip. The Edward Scenic Wetlands is having a fairy fest. We've participated before. We'll have a booth there. It, it's not really an outreach booth, it's an activity booth. We'll have a couple of people there with our Texas Master Naturalist tablecloth there. And um, Kathy Tong had gotten us some 
uh, decals or the little tattoos, the washable tattoos. And that went over real well a couple of years ago when we did the Fairy Fest. And I understand rumor has it Kathy and Pierre will be dressed up for the event. What are y'all going to be dressed as? Gonna be, he's going to be Mario, and I'm going to be Mario's sidekick. All right. <laughs> so that's what we're going to see. <laughs> but yeah, that's from 6 30 uh, till 10. And so we'll get some participation there too. Um, the one other thing I want to mention is our annual meeting. Uh, a lot of us have been working weekly, uh, regularly um, to accomplish a lot of things. If you've been on the state website, you'll see that we've got all field trips planned. They've got all the speakers planned. Uh, they've already been getting donations. HEB uh, made a $5,000 donation. So that was nice that they were able to do that. They're, they're still soliciting for donations. Um, the cost is has been set at $400 for the entire event. And that includes some of the meals, not quite all of them, but I know there's what, two luncheons and two dinners and maybe a box lunch on Saturday. Um, but the full schedule is there. And um, we are, we have discussed among the board uh, how to defray costs for our members. $400 is a lot of money. And uh, they will be needing some volunteers. The one thing we have been looking at that, um, is delayed our decision a little bit, and we'll certainly would like feedback from you here tonight, is um, the other chapter is saying that they can have about 40 volunteers, and we were thinking about 30 or 40 volunteers, but then if we ask everybody to work eight hours, that takes a whole day out of your activities. And it's only, you know, three days anyway, and basically then the one, Saturday when we're all be, going to be gone uh, for the outdoor field experience. So we're wanting to adjust that a little bit. Plus, we need to find out whether or not they have enough time slots for that many volunteers. So we didn't want to commit. The state is going back and looking and trying to beef up and look at all the areas to determine exactly how many. So we may say, since there's not as many opportunities for volunteering, we may not say we may cut back on the number of hours, maybe four or six hours if you can volunteer four hours. That would be so much easier and still get uh, hopefully half off as what we're looking at. So what are give me your thoughts? What, what would you like to see? Would how many would go? At the $400 cost. Because they're going to go anyway. Okay, I know several of us and several of us. Those of us that are involved in this have already been working for lots of hours already anyway. And then how many of you really feel like you would like to see the compensation to help? That That's the circumstances under which you would be able to attend that expense event. You know, it's, a, it's an investment. So one of the questions I have, I'm, I'm planning on taking time off to go to the conference, but I know people who work may only be able to go on Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a consideration too. They, they do have a two day pass, but it's still a lot of money. Yes, yes. So, and and that's why we were thinking either the, the probably half of whatever your cost is. So if you go for the two days and it's less, you can still get half of that back. So we would kind of prorate it is what we were thinking about. And then, you know, the only volunteer time you might be able to do is helping with cleanup and packing up stuff Sunday after the event. But that would be needed by a lot of the people. Vendors might need some help. Um, in addition to the state people needing to pack up all their stuff on Sunday. So those are things we're looking at. Um, the registration opens in August. They said something about the first week of August. So. Um, we're going to put our heads together as a board and see if we can come up with a, a firm answer for you so that when registration time comes, you know what the expectations are and what you can be reimbursed for. But we're kind of leaning towards that half off and, you know, like I say, maybe four hours. We'll, we'll see what 
hours they come up with. But, you know, if you're only going for two days, and you, we say you have to volunteer eight hours, that, that blows your whole time unless you happen to be able to sit in and help with speakers. And every one of those speakers you're helping for that half a day or a day are people you want to listen to. So that's not quite fair either. So we're going to try and make it good for everybody to get there. Are there any questions about that or any other comment, comments? Comment, uh, if there's people working like Jennifer says and they have vacation time coming or days off, they can plan on that ahead of time. Right. Well, and the schedule is out. The, the field school schedule, I mean, the field trip schedule and the um, uh, classroom or the classroom talks or the schedule is out on the state site. So do look at that. Uh, it was like a 55 page document, I think, but I, you can save it um, as a digital and it's much easier to read if you save the file than it is to try and uh, look at what they have on the state site because it just is a better file when it's saved as a PDF file. And Anne is involved in the silent auction. You want to tell them a little bit about that, Anne? Um. Well, this, if you haven't been to an annual meeting, they have a silent auction, one room with just tables of things, like our silent auction that we have in December, and the third party we have a silent auction. It's very similar to that. So I want to put a request out to all of you, to all of our members, to start reading things that are one thing being in here, and we'll start collecting them. I think there's one person from the American TV chapter. Our chapter. We do it together. And it's like you gotta stay there all day and watch the stuff or set the schedule. People come in and just sign their name on the sheet, and at the end of the day, the person at the end of the conference, whoever gets the highest bid and most gets ready. Start thinking about what you want to donate. It should be all nature related. You know, people say people are afraid of nature. So we'll we'll want to. Uh, help support with that activity. People do all kinds of things, bird houses, bat houses, but paintings. I've seen everything. I shouldn't say it. And, and they, they do have the option of if you want to donate something that is not very big item, it can be clumped with something else to make a bigger, more um, affordable or desirable. And so they sent a letter out to all the invaded and sent it out to all the presidents to let their chapters know. And usually they do that. We have chapters that come in over and items for the site and option. We all earn 50% of the site and option and the other it's, chapters go up. It's 20%. Oh, it's 20%. Yeah. And, and we split that 20 with the other chapter. Oh my gosh. I thought it was 20%. It's, it's going to be a lot of work. We'll double check those figures. But. And then, um, Jennifer, you've been involved in the art and uh, other competition. I'll tell them a little bit about that. Sure. Should I go to the front? You can come to the front. Yes, please. So there is a photo and art contest as part of the state meeting. It is virtual. So the submissions would all be done online. Um, that should open up August 15th and close September 15th. And it's not just um, photography. It also includes um, art artwork, quilts, all sorts of crafts that relate to nature in Texas. So the, the rules have been posted on the state website and submissions will open August 15th and then the voting will start October 1st and the winners will be announced at the state meeting. So if you, I know that there's people who have beautiful photography um, and I hope to see some of our submissions in the contest this year. Yes. I've got an owl. I'm just dying to submit. He looks like so curious when he's going to cut his picture. Oh, that's right. <laughs> well, and I know Joseph is doing a presentation. Uh, Becky has, uh, you're involved with the field trip to um, Benny Cook. And um, now, did you wind up with a program about Benny Cook too? Yes, with Sylvia. Okay. Actually, Sylvia is headlined again. Okay. Um, and Anita's doing one or two, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Six. Oh, it's six. <laughs> no, well, I think it's two or three, maybe. But she's she got it spread out over several different days. And um, so, yeah, our chapter has been well involved. And 
Uh, we've been working with the other chapter and having regular meetings with the state. So um, I hope everybody's interested in attending it, and we will keep uh, keep you informed. Donna, when you sent out the uh, invitation for the most girls to put the invitation for the next month's meeting, um, did you put a reminder in there for great items? I will, yes, and you help me remember. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our next board meeting is August 7th. We are still doing them virtually. If anybody wants to attend, just let us know. The next general meeting is August 21st in person here. And we will have a September 18th meeting, and that's the snakes. We're not going to do the Monday in October because that's the Monday right after our state meeting, and I think we'll all be tired. So um, we'll be looking at then a combined meeting um, that will be our last of the year, uh, November, December, something in there, to get our election of officers and stuff. So the time is gonna go fast. Um, and then the annual meeting is the 12th or 15th of October. Are there any questions? I'm getting us out of here. Right at eight o'clock. I've been looking at that clock. I, I don't know how accurate that is, but is it close enough? Eight oh one. one. <laughs> okay. So that's a fifteen minute or point two five business meeting. All right. Let's keep it to a minimum. We got to have more fun and listen to more dragonflies stories. I need to go to Amazon and get me those binoculars yeah. before I forget what it was they looked like. And then, do you use a macro lens when you do your photography? No. no. How do you get those good pictures? You just, I'm a dragonfly. I'm a dragonfly. Dragonfly whisperer. I can believe it. That is far from the dark. That's right. The dragonfly. Yeah. 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 Donna, yeah. tell Bob Sylvia what time. What's that? Can you tell Bob Sylvia what time? 